Good evening, everybody. I'm um, Paolo De Matteo, Associate Professor of uh, Chinese Art at the History of Art and Visual Culture Department here at RISD, and I'd like you to, uh, to welcome you here at RISD and the RISD Museum for the talk of Angela Sheng, um, Demystifying Chinese Silk, Intercultural Innovation and Textile Art and Technology. I'd like to thank uh, my own department, the History of Art and Visual Culture Department at RISD, and the Division of Liberal Arts uh, for sponsoring the talk, as well as the RISD Museum, and. Uh, the um, Brown University History Department, uh, Professor Brocka, who's right here, and um, Professor Chung Tan uh, for the Year of China, as well as the Half and Refer Museum. This talk is also happening in conjunction with an exhibition here, there is a museum, uh, uh, which is titled From the Land of Immortals, Chinese Taoist Robes and Textiles, which I uh, co-curated with my colleague in the textile department at the RISD Museum, Kate, Kate Irving. And uh, if you haven't seen it, you can see it tonight. It's, the museum is open until 9 p.m. And uh, it's on the sixth floor of the museum. I just want to alert you to other events that relate to either China or textiles or Taoism. And uh, on uh, Tuesday, April 3rd, I have invited uh, a Taoist master to come and uh, kind of explain how these robes are used and uh, how they're performed. Um, and he will uh, lecture at the Rizzi Museum on the sixth floor near the, the exhibition at 11.30 in the morning for my class. And then there will be more other activities in the afternoon at Brown, which haven't been yet uh, kind of scheduled. And then on April 5th, uh, there will be a Taoist gallery walk, uh, which will start at 5.30 at Brown at the Hatton Refer Museum, and then we'll, we'll proceed to RISD, and we'll end around 7.30. So you're all welcome to come and participate in these activities. And now I'm going to let um, Professor Cynthia Brocker from the History Department at Brown University will actually do the formal introduction of uh, uh, Professor Angela Sheng and uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. Um, as Paula explained, this event uh, originated as, as part of Brown's year-long series of lectures, workshops, exhibits, and performances uh, designed to inform uh, the Brown and the larger Providence community about Chinese history, culture, and society, uh, both past and present. Um, as such, it is one of several entries in a series of lectures on technology and society in, in pre-modern China. And again, as Paula has indicated, is supported by the Year of China, the Department of History, and the Hafenrefer Museum at, at, at Brown. Um, but success in planning this lecture, and certainly in securing this very impressive venue for it, would not have been possible uh, without the very generous support uh, and assistance from the Rhode Island School of Design, specifically RISD's Department of History, uh, the History of Art and Visual Culture, the Division of Liberal Arts, and the Museum of, of Art. Uh, now, to introduce the speaker this evening, uh, this is Angela Shung, Associate Professor of Art History at McMaster uh, University. Uh, Angela Shung received her PhD in Oriental Studies, um, now actually um, uh, the Department of East Asian uh, Languages and Civilizations, from the University of Pennsylvania uh, in 1990 with fields in Chinese art history, uh, the history of Chinese science and technology, and symbolic anthropology. Uh, she also studied uh, weaving at RISD, so to some extent this is a return um, to uh, one of her homes um, uh, for uh, Angela, um, and at the School for Industrial Arts in Copenhagen, uh, and then also studied textile and dye analysis at the Canadian Institute of Conservation, the Centre d'Etudes Internationales des Textiles Anciennes in Lyon, France, and l'École des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Uh, she began her academic career at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, uh, first as a curatorial fellow and then as assistant curator in charge of Asian textiles. After leaving the Royal Ontario Museum uh, for family reasons, she taught at universities in Taiwan and Japan and at McGill, again in Canada, before joining McMaster in 2005. And in 2009, at McMaster, she was appointed the first director of the Confucius Institute, a position she still holds. 
She's also worked extensively as a consultant in cross-cultural communication with clients in both Asia and Canada. Uh, Professor Shang, drawing on her anthropological training, reads costumes and textiles both as, as functional art and as documentation of human negotiations um, with others and also with time, place, and space. In pursuit of these themes, she has studied intercultural exchanges along the Silk Road as part of the Reuniting the Treasures of Turfan project organized by Yale and Peking universities and funded by the Luce Foundation in 1996-98. From 2005 to 2008, she worked on the touring exhibit and catalog entitled Writing with Threads, Traditional Textiles of Southwest China Minorities, which is based on the collection at the Evergrande Museum in Taiwan and organized by the University of Hawaii Art Gallery. In 2007, Professor Shang expanded her geographical horizons even farther with research on Inuit art and material culture as part of a project comparing Inuit art with that of selected Chinese minority peoples. More recently, in 2011, she contributed a segment on China, A Glimpse of China in the 18th Century, to the exhibit Rising to the Occasion, the Long 18th Century, at the McMaster Museum of Art. Uh, she is working now on a major long-term project on interculturality, memory, and meaning that includes a book manuscript, Reading Textiles, Agency, and Intercultural Transmission of Art and Technology Along the Silk Road in the First Millennium. And Professor Sheng will speak to us today, just to repeat her title, on Demystifying Early Chinese Silks, Intercultural Innovation in Textile Art and Technology. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Shang? Thank you very much. Good evening to all. Um, as mentioned, I was very fortunate to have um, started studying um, weaving here, RISI, uh, in the summer of 1984 as a PhD candidate. And my a uh, wonderful teacher was Alice Marcoux, so I would like to thank her very much for um, initiating me into weaving. Uh, I also have to tell you, she took the class on a um, field trip to a sheep farm nearby. And uh, of course, we saw the whole process of um, obtaining wool and processing it into fiber. Um, had I not been there, I would never have guessed each sheep would weigh about 400, 500 pounds. Um, it left a deep impression on me. Um, thank you, Professor Broca, for inviting me. And uh, thank you uh, for um, showing me your wonderful collection, Kate and uh, Emery, this afternoon. Um, I. I'm delighted that I can talk to you about uh, why early uh, Chinese silks might be mysterious. Uh, how was nature harnessed and what knowledge was developed? Around 3650, uh, 3, 3, 3,650 BCE before the Common Era, Silk was already woven in northern China, as attested by some fragments of silk, tabby, and twine silk, which we see on our left uh, in um, some child's urns. Uh, but I, I didn't put the urn. I put uh, Yang Shao pot for you to associate uh, the early discovery with Yang Shao culture. Um, they were unearthed in the 1980s at Qingtai village uh, in um, Henan. So here's Beijing, here's Shanghai. Uh, just out of interest, how many of you have been to China? How many of you have been to the Silk Road? How many of you weave? Okay, how many of you have worn silk? That should be everybody, right? Okay. Um, the twine silk was further, further first degummed and then dyed red, but over time uh, it had faded. Um, the art 
of dying was one of the six major uh, categories preserved in Kao Gongji, the record of the examination of crafts written in the spring autumn period, um, roughly what, 5th century BCE, along with carpentry, metallurgy, tanning, leather work, uh, stonemasonry, ceramic arts. Silk fragments, along with some woven hemp of Liangzhu culture, um, further here uh, to the coast, um, were found in a bamboo basket in 1958, further south, in the coastal province of Zhejiang, at Qianshanyang uh, site. Um, I placed a typical Liangzhu jade tong beside it to remind us of the associated culture. Um, in passing, um, this kind of tong with um, cylindrical uh, space in, on the inside and a uh, square definition around had been interpreted in a way as a mapping of um, urban site. And of course, uh, we recognize the early um, animal mask. Um, these finds, uh, this is dated, carbon dated to 2750 BCE. These finds reveal that silk weaving had spread widely in Neolithic China by the Shang Dynasty, so 16th to 11th century BC, we're sort of jumping by the century. Uh, the silk weaving, uh, the weavers could already make pattern in the warp. Uh, and what we see here is a geometric thunder pattern that's regular, repeated, and in the warp. Um, in the warp means that the warp threads, which are hung between the warp beam and the cloth beam longitudinally, are used for patterning. This will be increasingly important for us. Um, other imprints were also found on bronze implements, and clearly patterned silk was as precious as ritual jade and bronze. Um, like textiles of other fibers, such as wool, cotton, hemp, uh, silks can be embellished by four methods of ornamentation, painting, embroidery, dyeing, and weaving. Painting is not usually used uh, for embellishing textiles or clothing and furnishing because it will not withstand the expected wear and tear. Um, embroidery gives the most latitude in free expression as it is done with a needle and thread. In other words, anyone can embroider anything, on uh, any motifs on textiles or even leather or paper, and anywhere. It's very portable. Dyeing involves uh, processing dye pigments from plants and minerals, applying mordants for staying the colors, locating a good supply of water for making dye baths and extensive rinsing. The dyeing of both yarn and finished goods, that means either before or after weaving, is generally done in large quantities and collectively by many hands together as in a workshop or in a village. Um, I have a slide up here uh, that is taken from a uh, catalog on um, ancient weaving in Nishijin, Kyoto, which uh, reproduced uh, popular Japanese weaves that were based on Tang Dynasty weaves, and I will be coming back to this. And here you can see uh, red vertically. Uh, the artist is making a pattern design on paper transferring it on here onto the loom. Uh, and here we see various processes which I will be explaining. And here is the dye baths. Uh, that's very complicated until finally the uh, weaving. Now, uh, weaving can be done on simple and complex looms. Before one can actually weave, however, one must prepare for the warp and the weft. And this process 
involves tedious tasks of twisting, spinning, uh, winding yarns, and so forth. Unlike dyed and embroidered patterns that can be removed from fabrics without destroying the fabrics, woven designs are integrated into the very fabrics themselves. Um, in other words, if you want, if you were to cut away a woven fabric, then you have destroyed the fabric. So to weave patterns also requires more resources of all kinds and technology, than both uh, embroidery and dyeing. So for this reason, textiles with woven patterns are usually the most prized. My intention this evening then is to unravel the warp and weft, if you will permit me this metaphor, of early Chinese silks by surveying sericulture and silk weaving and see what impact Chinese silk weaving had on weaving outside China, as well as how Chinese silk weaving was influenced by other technologies transmitted along the Silk Road. My main hypothesis is that innovation requires experiential learning and experimentation. To be clear, technologies are broadly defined as social and cultural processes of techniques that allow workers to create and produce tangible results otherwise unobtainable. In this, I'm following the French socio-anthropological discourse on technology and culture that can be traced to Marcel Moss and Pierre Lemonnier. Uh, in passing, I was very lucky to have been Pierre Lemonnier's uh, seminar when I was uh, doing my dissertation research in Europe. Also, I will be drawing from the extensive research done on sericulture and silk weaving by many earlier scholars, such as the later Schuyler Kamen, my mentor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Amano Motonosuke, Ota Aizo, Nonomo Jinro in Japan, many in China, notably the late Shanai and the late Wang Xu. Wang Xu was the um, conservator who, uh, when uh, Romania asked Zhou Enlai to repair their 15th century Bible, that uh, Wang came up with a silk gauze um, protector that was then used for um, conserving ancient silks. Um, other scholars in China, like Chen Weiji, Zhao Shengzi, Wu Ming, who was a curator at the um, museum in Wurongji, Chen Juanjuan, and more recently, Zhao Feng, my colleague, who is the director of National Silk Museum in Hangzhou. Um, also, the late John Becker in Denmark, uh, I studied with him. Uh, he was uh, experimenting to reweave ancient Chinese weaves and Middle Eastern Persian weaves successfully, and Dieter Kuhn of Germany. So thanks to all these scholars' work I had, I've been able to do what I am able to do. As silks are woven of silk filaments spit by silkworms that survive on mulberry leaves, let's first look at the evidence of the mulberry. Many varieties were native to China, all belonging to the Morassisi family, both the white mulberry, which I'm showing on the screen, uh, albai, and the jing sang grew in the wild, and were then domesticated according to Book of Odes written in the Zhou times, 1050 to 256 BCE, roughly. Pictorial depictions on bronze vessels of the Warring States, so 450 to 221 BCE, show women picking leaves from short uh, and taller trees. You see them climbing up. Um, we know that this appeared to be women's work at this early time. Uh, I'm very interested in the gendering of um, labor involved in textile work. Uh, I will come back to this as well. Due to convenience, the shorter kind prevailed. Uh, after the 14th century, 
a grafted variety spread to the lower Yangtze region. And on the screen is uh, a scene, uh, this is the mulberry field in Hangzhou. Uh, I don't know if you've been to this famous um, uh, city which is extremely humid in the summer. Back to um, people in the Zhou times, they already knew it was best to plant the mulberry in warm, humid, and fertile soil for it to flourish. And close to roads and houses for easier care. To ensure an adequate supply of the leaves, mulberry groves were well maintained, and even laws were passed forbidding the casual cutting down of any branches. The yield varied widely. It depended on such factors as the age and the height of the tree, the density of planting, the number of crops per year, uh, which uh, in early China was restricted to one per year. And uh, Professor Lillian Li's work on the mulberry planting in Jiaxing, which is near Shanghai in the 17th century, shows that if the trees were planted in a scattered, open fashion, the yield will be two to three times more abundant than if they were densely packed. Although women were shown picking the mulberry leaves uh, in early times, by the first millennium, men also did this work as prescribed by this very important 6th century text, Qi Ming Yao Shu, important uh, formula for ensuring people's welfare. It was written by Jia Sixie, a man of the Northern Wei Dynasty. Uh, it's a very extensive agricultural manual um, and with many, many interesting uh, recipes for uh, doing all kinds of things. Um, and from a 14th century text, the famous book of agriculture written by Wang Zhen, who was a scholar, also a local official, very interested in uh, agricultural technologies, obviously. Uh, we see, this is a modern reprint, but we see men climbing up to the higher variety to collect uh, mulberry leaves. Um, in his text, he discusses in detail the kind of baskets were used, the kinds of knives that were used. Every step was scrutinized. Mulberry leaves were not the only kind fed to silkworms, but the mulberry guaranteed, especially the white mulberry, I should say, guaranteed a smooth and glossy filament. Silkworms fed with oak leaves, for example, spit filaments of a coarser variety, more knotted and textured to the touch when woven as wild silks. I'm sure you have come across uh, some of the examples of that previously. Growing the mulberry was only one necessary aspect of sericulture as the critical process was raising the silkworm. If the mulberry uh, already appeared in a Babylonian love story as first told by Ovid. So his time was 43 BCE to um, 17 in the common era. In his uh, work Metamorphosis, we know not if the locals in ancient uh, West Asia commanded detailed knowledge to maximize the output of the mulberry, for example. And since we have no records that the Chinese actually traveled to West Asia, it's probably not likely that they would have shared their know-how. Also, even if they grew the mulberry, without the silkworm, there was still no silk in the West, at least in all its time. Rumors have it that two Persian monks smuggled silkworms in the hollow of their canes uh, to Emperor Justinian, so that's in the 5th, 43, 565 in the common era. Certainly by the 5th century, Central Asians were growing the mulberry and had learned to raise silkworms, and I'll come back to this. I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the silkworm, as you will see, because of the technology and the weaving involved. 
to appreciate just how delicate an operation raising silk, the, raising the silkworm is and how things could easily go wrong at every stage, we will now look at the process. The silkworms are hatched from eggs each spring. The eggs are stored in winter inside folded paper at temperatures between five, four and five degrees centigrade. So um, Wang Zhen's book of uh, agriculture in 1313, for example, detailed on uh, how to control the temperature uh, and the uh, right amount of moisture. When the leaves of the mulberry have started to grow to the size of a coin, um, about 1.5 centimeters, it will be time to hatch the eggs. The timing roughly coincides with the coming of the spring. In early China, on the first day of the lunar third month, women first wash the eggs in clear streams to rid of any impurities. Aristocratic ladies led this ritual, uh, reflecting the importance according to this uh, to sericulture in Zhou times. So that's 1000 BCE. Prayers were then offered to the deity associated with sericulture for bountiful harvest. The importance of the deity reflected the precarious nature of the harvest, that is, the harvest of the silk filament, and the traditional and idealized confusion division of labor, that is, whereas men till the land, women wove textiles for clothing. In reality, both men and women peasants worked the land. Both men and women were involved in textile production, doing different tasks according to social status, as we shall see. Anticipating the sprouting of the mulberry by about 10 days, the eggs were wrapped up in paper and cotton and moved to a warm place. In about six days, the eggs, had, the eggs had become ant-like, ready to change into worms. Then the tiny silk worms are moved from paper to a bamboo basket where they should crawl with enough room, not touching each other, as here. And the mulberry leaves are cleaned and fed to the silk worms. The little black dots are the feces and they must be uh, removed. The lack of hygiene could kill off the silkworms easily. Trust me, that's not an easy job. I did this when I was a child. On average, it would take about 30 to 35 days for a silkworm to grow to about nine centimeters in length through several moltings of sleep and casting of skin. Ash gray or creamy yellow, the silkworms are extremely smooth and cool to the touch. This had always astounded me as a child, uh, how slippery uh, these silkworms were. Because you know, you, you want to clean and feed, uh, you have to move them. Anyway, when mature and ready to make their cocoons, the silkworms are placed on silkworm hills. These are straw bundles for them to uh, place uh, their cocoons. Only a few moths of clean, hard, white cocoons will be allowed to fly out of the cocoons as moths so that they could mate, and for the female moths to lay eggs for next year's crop, thus renewing the life cycle of the silkworm. This process fascinated Chinese observers in early times as the silkworm's life cycle could summarize the rebirth of the human soul after death. The pictorial representation of the silkworm uh, then could capture the soul's transformation. Uh, to wit, we have on our left a uh, enlarged uh, pictorial representation of a jade carving with a human head and a pupa-like body dating to the Zhou times, uh, actually earlier than that. Uh, the pupa body could be either that of the silkworm or the cicada. Both shed skins before the moths fly into the skies, just like the human's young soul was believed to have soared after death while the in-soul remained on earth. 
Um, I'm foreshadowing what I will be discussing in terms of some important textile finds. A half-cut silk cocoon dated to 3000 BCE found in 1929, again in uh, uh, Yangshao cultural site, reveals that sericulture had indeed already begun there. Apparently, it was cut for uh, the people, whoever, to eat the chrysalis for its mystical nutrition. The pictorial representations of the silkworm at any stage of this life cycle indicate awareness, if not technical knowledge of sericulture. Some ivory carving with four pairs of silkworms found uh, in the late 1970s uh, in the Zhejiang province near the Huzhou area, um, and uh, twinned paired black paws, would these show the um, drawings of the silkworm? Uh, this is at uh, Qijia culture site in Gansu, northwest China. Um, securely date the awareness and the raising of silkworms to early times. So to remind, raising silkworms was a seasonal and labor-intensive activity and mostly dependent on the so-called idle hands of women, even children, inside a household. Over time, it grew into a widespread cottage industry, especially as plain woven silk was taxed, and uh, along with grain and corvée labor, Silk was also used as currency well into the second millennium. Um, the uh, Royal Asiatic Society will be publishing a special issue soon on textiles as currency that I participated in. It's probably coming out later this year. Now, um, to raise silkworms, uh, what really we want to do is to reel the silk. Here, let me quote Dieter Kuhn. The body of the caterpillar consists of a hard head, three thoracic segments, 11 abdominal segments, the eighth, eighth with a dorsal horn. To produce the silk filaments, the caterpillar has silk glands, which consist of two long sacs running along the side of the body. The spinneret opens on the underlip of the larva. To make the cocoon, the larva ejects a continuous brin from both glands simultaneously by moving its head round in a figure eight regularly for two to four days. The natural filament consists of two brins, fibroing of white semi-transparent protein with a jade-like luster, which appear to the eye as a single thread. It is covered by sericin or silk gum, and that must be removed in order for the silk to receive dye color. So when we think about that was already done in Neolithic times, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, only after degumming, boiling the silk in mildly alkaline solution, but you could also soak it, can the individual brain filaments separate. Uh, and on the right, we see uh, selected cocoons to be reeled. They come in naturally different shades and the luster is uh, obvious. Each silk filament, if unreeled directly from a cocoon, averages about 10 to 30 microns, or 1,000 of uh, millimeter, in width and about 600 meters, or even 900 to 3,000 meters in length. This is remarkable. This extraordinary length and tensile strength some textile historians have argued, led the Chinese to specialize in warp-faced weaving, such as the polychrome silk weaves found from Lady Dai's tomb that I'm going to show you fairly soon. The cocoons are killed for reeling of the filaments. This posed a moral dilemma for some Buddhist devotees uh, along the Silk Road in the first millennium. Some chose not to, uh, some chose to cut the cocoons to let the moths fly out, and as a result, must twist the cut short silk fibers, much like twisting short wool fibers into long yarns. 
The twist will be a Z and not a typical Chinese S twist. So here I have um, extracted two pages from a classical uh, textile text to show you here this is an enlarged view of the silk filaments that's uh, pretty smooth and long, up to three, uh, what did I say, 3,000 meters. And here we see the short wool filament, and you can see they are these uh, layers. Uh, and even when you uh, look at your own wool sweaters or wool garments, the short fibers actually interlock. So when they um, are woven, uh, they will, it's not likely to separate. Um, here's a trick when you uh, want to clean your cashmere sweaters. After you gently rinse, you um, soak it in water and white vinegar. It'll revive the um, fiber so that they will be upright and interlock again, and that's why they will look very fresh. But um, this is why uh, some his textile historians have also argued that the wool fibers, the short wool fibers, they interlock, uh, favored weft-facing uh, weaving, patterning in the weft. So basically we're discussing, did the Chinese uniquely invent warp face weaving and the Westerners weft face weaving, and how did the two come together? Um, back to um, those who chose to give the moth's life. Uh, this kind of smooth filament as silk, when cut, would not be easily twisted. And um, no wonder this compassionate but impractical method was soon abandoned. They don't do that along the Silk Road, not in Uzbekistan, not in um, Hotan, closer to the Taklamakan Desert anymore. Once unreeled, the long silk filaments are processed so they could be dyed in color, further combined, sorted as warp threads to be dressed on the loom, twisted as weft, and wound to shuttles. Um, here we see some uh, key stages represented by 23 color engravings ordered by the Manchu Emperor Kangxi, whose reign period was 1661 to 1772. This was uh, commissioned in 1696. They are kept at the National Library in Florence. There's a similar set at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. I'll go over it quickly. Here we see the critical stage of um, boiling the cocoons to unreal. And uh, I, I have to say this is a very idealized, iconic view of uh, the sericulture um, as evident in the uh, harmonious um, colors. Um, here we see the man doing the um, dye work. Now here, uh, probably because dye baths can be very stinky and uh, coloration will go onto your hands. I don't believe they use rubber gloves at the time. This work was mostly done by men. Um, and here we see that they have um, gotten their yarn together, making offerings to thank for the harvest of the sericulture, the silk filament. And here now we see a uh, woman preparing some dyed yarn, uh, silk winding onto small um, shuttle, not really shuttle, small spools, uh, so that uh, here we follow this for either the warp or the weft. Um, even though the single filament has strong tensile strength for weaving, uh, usually it's two plied uh, minimum and um, we'll see how densely they're done. Here we see, we follow the uh, small um, bobbins, and this is warping and ready to be dressed. Now, this represents the natural length of the silk filament. Here we have an example of a draw loom with a draw person helping to control individual warps, and the weaver controls individual weft for making patterns. And here we, we see an idyllic scene 
of a housewife making simple plain silks, the kind for taxation. Um, plain silks could have been woven on simple backstrap looms, as here we see. Uh, this is from a cowrie, a bronze cowrie container found in Yunnan province in southwest China, uh, or on slanted looms. This is a rubbing from uh, Sihongxian Han Dynasty uh, near Zhejiang area. And it is a story of Zheng Zi, uh, one of Confucius' disciples. He, he's here, seated here. His mother turns to him, not believing that he was accused of wrongdoing. Um, the uh, weaving as a parable was often used in uh, didactic stories. Uh, in fact, the word warp itself is of great importance. For example, um, sutras are called uh, whatever, Lotus Sutra, Jing, as in warp. So the warp and weft of social fabric. Um, now I'm afraid I'll have to bore you with a little bit of this um, weave structure. On the left, we have the tabby. That's the simplest kind of weaving one over the other. So all this, the tabby, the twill, and the satin, is single warp, single weft. And I will be moving into compound sets for patterning. This is where the ingenuity comes in. And we have these different kinds of looms in early China already. Now uh, here, one, one, this is at least two to three, one, it involves a number of sheds on the loom to raise warps simultaneously for the uh, ground weave to bind the fabric so that it will not fall apart. Um, even on simple looms with patience, a skill weaver can pick through a uh, weft and make intricate patterns. Here is a Lee woman weaver that I met in 2007 on uh, Hainan Island. And this is um, her weaving on a backstrap loom with um, symbols of water for ri river black lines and insects, butterflies for pollination and so forth. So now, um, fancy silks, how were they woven? I'm now going to take us to Ma Wangdui, uh, which is near Changsha, central China here, near Lake Dongting. Um, mostly to look at uh, astonishing silks that were unearthed from number one Han tomb of Lady Dai uh, in 1972. Um, from her tomb, we have the four varieties of silks that is painted as this one. This is a uh, name banner. I don't know if you have seen this before. Uh, it's extremely intricate. As you can see, there is, uh, it's in the shape of uh, abbreviated clothing like a kimono. Kimono, Japanese word, is actually from Tang Dynasty, early Han Dynasty style clothing. It was hung on a pole above her burial site to identify her place. And this name banner is unusual in that it did not use words to identify her, but rather painted. This is Lady Dai with her signature cane. Now I've argued elsewhere that all the pictorial representations of um, fabric were totally keyed to the um, artistic program of the entire tomb. So for example, only Lady Dai on the painting is shown wearing curvilinear design. Um, we have silk, plain silk, and her attendants in plain silk. Then we have geometric patterns that separate her. The, the whole painting is in four concentric, four parts that correspond to uh, four concentric, uh, four leveled uh, coffins. This is the permanent home of her underground, uh, her underground home for her uh, 
in Seoul. This is where um, it was staged for her entertainment afterlife. And here we have found enormous number of textiles. This is the inner coffin, uh, and the top is pasted with um, special embroideries, so the second type of embellishment or ornamentation. If you read the top, you can actually see it's like the word for sun, ru. Uh, here, that's the word. Um, and on the left, you can see this is this part here. In the center, it is almost like a bird's face. Um, this is known as um, a kind of embroidery where kingfisher feathers and bird's feathers were pasted in a geometric pattern that resembled woven patterns. On the right, we have a um, embroidery that was to imitate the bird's dawn. So clearly, birds were very important. We also found um, other examples of embroidery with meaning like longevity for this and uh, riding the clouds all to facilitate the rise of the uh, young soul. Sorry. Um, we also from <clears throat> have this uh, from uh, her tomb, dyed um, printed textiles, as you can see, the earliest printed kind. Um, using the late anthropologist Alfred Gell's theory of the technology of enchantment, enchantment of technology, he was studying the carved um, canoes of the Trobrianders. I've elsewhere argued that the textile artisans in Lady Dai's time, in 2nd century BCE, in central China of true culture, ingeniously created designs to enchant the spirits that they believed the deceased was likely to encounter in her journey after death. Um, analysis of all unearthed silks and reveal more than 20 shades of colors were dyed, ranging from burgundy, deep red, purple, dark green, yellow, blue, gray, and black. Um, some, like these that are shown, were further uh, printed with patterns where you have to match the blocks and further printed with um, gold and silver powder. The artisans were close to have developed the silk screening process at this stage, so second century BCE, but it was not until the sixth century that dyers made tremendous progress in printing, and that predated the printing of first um, Buddhist um, images for prayer, and then paper money in the 10th century. But already back in the second century BC, we have uh, luxury production uh, for the consumption of the uh, aristocracy. Now when plain silks in tabby were painted or embroidered, lightweight silks uh, were printed with designs, other silks were complex in weave structure. So here we have monochromatic design. Uh, it's called qi, which really means warp face design with picked pattern in the twill. The pattern is shown here, the paired bird within the um, rhomboid repeated geometric pattern, which you have seen. Now this will um, be connected with the pearl roundel later. Again, the birds is the association with the soaring um, spirit. Uh, we also have very complicated gauzes, which require the warps not to lie on top of each other, but intertwine. And this one is four intertwined at once. And again, the pattern is geometric. So by now, you probably realize uh, geometric patterns are easier to, make, to, to control to make than curvilinear designs. And that will not happen until later. But even so, this was pretty phenomenal. 
The uh, most amazing uh, find from Lady Di's tomb was the polychrome warp face compound tabby on the left with small uh, geometric patterns. And on the right, uh, a prototype of velvet. So uh, let me uh, emphasize that the pattern is in the warp because to make the patterns, there's more than one set of warp. In other words, several sets of warps in different colors, and different colors can be picked up for the patterning. And in terms of making the loop for the velvet, you have to actually insert a thin wire uh, for it to be looped, and then once the fabric is woven, the thin wires are removed, and when we make velvet later, it's cut. At this point, it's not cut. And I suspect this was done, again, to imitate the featheriness of uh, birds for the purpose of the journey. Now, based on the variety, the regularity of patterns, and consistently high density. So that's on average 180 to 220 warps per centimeter and 50 weft per centimeter. So that is incredibly dense. The high count of the warp explains the triple amount of uh, yarn that was put through than the weft. Um, silk on earth from Lady Di's tomb. Oh, I forgot to mention there was also this other changing towel, but we can um, bypass that since that was braided and not woven. Um, they were woven probably in state workshops derived from earlier royal workshops that had unlimited resources. And here we can see the slanted loom uh, on the ground floor of a two-story building with typical Gong or bracketing architectural style. The discovery of a bronze seal with the words Central Weaving Workshop Seal, Zhongzhi Shi Shu, from a tomb in Changsha, in other words, near Lady Dai's tomb, dating to the similar time period, confirms such a workshop. It was likely located outside city walls near the stables and close to the artisans' quarters. Only women seem to have worked in such state workshops, embroidering, dyeing, and weaving silks. They were often nubi, or slave-like serfs, converted from criminals or prisoners of war and their families. Even aristocrats could not be uh, exempt if they were captured. They worked under the surveillance of a master foreman called gongshi or zhishi, a textile master supervised the production and controlled the quality like other contemporaneous masters of other crafts, for example, casting objects in bronze or making them in lacquer. Lacquerware was very common in this area due to the high humidity and the native uh, lacquer tree. An inked signature of new wushi, woman master's surname Wu, accompanied by a cinnabar imprint of a seal on a brown silk fragment also found in the area, will confirm that women led at least one textile workshop of this kind. These textile women workers were highly valued. They were even considered as indemnity for peace when the true state, so in the central part of China, asked the Lu state, which is in northeast China, uh, modern day uh, Shandong, for skilled weavers and seamstresses and wood carvers in 589 BCE. Their southward migration to the true culture area several centuries prior to Lady Dai's time would account for the capacity of textile workshops in her time to have such high technical mastery while the motifs reflected local cultural traditions. I mean by that the emphasis on uh, bird-like motifs, bird-like feathers, and so forth. Whereas unskilled women were paid half of what skilled men, unskilled men got, skilled textile women workers received the same amount of pay. But their skill also bound them to their hereditary status from which they could not be freed. 
Still, when population expanded and some left the fields to take up artisanal work, in the first century, some peasants even sold themselves as private serfs to work in private workshops. So we now know in the first century, uh, we have state workshops and private workshops. The woven patterns were at first uh, mostly geometric and linear. Uh, here on the left, I'm showing you the same kind of polychrome warface compound tabby discovered even earlier than Lady Dai's uh, time at Mashan Jiangling, and you can see it's also geometric patterns. Um, but soon, with time, we have curvilinear designs. This is a phenomenal piece. It's a shoulder cover found in Nia uh, with words, Wu Xing Chu Zhongguo, five stars appear in China. This is pretty phenomenal, first to third century Nia. Here we see curvilinear designs, typical quadrupeds floating above the clouds, and so forth. Uh, we have many examples of such polychrome warp face compound tabby, usually translated as brocades, uh, which is technically speaking not correct, as brocading refers to a specific uh, weaving technique. Um, at this time, uh, here we have paired um, dra uh, phoenix and uh, tiger. With, uh, this is their reproduction, uh, unclosed by um, what was borrowed from Roman arches, mediated through South Asian um, architectural feature chaitya that you often see. This was discovered in Cave 17 at Donghuang. So at this point, um, fifth, early 5th, 6th century, uh, we begin to see the um, influence of external decorative designs coming in, but the technique remained the same, still warp-faced compound tabby. Um, <clears throat> Sometime after the 6th century, Chinese weavers began to weave the weft patterned twill. Weft patterned means that the patterning is made in picking through the weft and not in the warp. Um, to weave the twill, a weaver would need a loom with at least three, but more commonly four shedding devices, heddles or shafts, to lift the warp um, in three or four groups. Due to the short wool fiber that must be twisted into yarn for weaving, warp would not withstand much manipulation for patterning as uh, uh, would silk warp. So textile historians have argued that wool weavers made patterns in the weft or wool weft faced woolens. The earliest twills were woven in short woolen fiber in central and eastern highlands of Anatolia um, maybe elsewhere independently as well. This is according to um, Elizabeth Wynne Barber. Uh, in the 1990s, the Sino-French archaeological team excavated at the site of Jumbala Kum, uh, the proto-historical Caria Delta. So here, they came here. Uh, Nia is, uh, I, I can see it around, here's Nia, that's where uh, we saw the five stars from China. Nia was excavated uh, a joint uh, expedition between Japanese and uh, China, and uh, Caria was French and uh, China, and this was their um, um, expedition along the Southern Silk Road, and they found um, woven wool twill around 1200 BCE, but in fact, we also know that wool tartan was woven um, at the same time. Now, Barber uh, has uh, linked this with uh, Celtic uh, woolens of the same time period. She has also argued that linguistically they were um, related. 
Uh, regardless, it is pretty phenomenal that back in 1200 BCE, uh, woolens with patterns in the weft, and you can see the twill as in the slanted lines were already woven then. Uh, and here we have a wool fragment dated to Eastern Han, so second century in the common era, also from Nia. And I would like you to notice the rough design of the quatrefoil in rhomboids at uh, this point. Uh, the patterning is in the twill, not in the uh, warp. In the frequently cited, so um, possibly the Chinese, when they started to make web-faced patterns, they learned from the nomads how to do it because the nomads have this tradition, or that they have uh, progressed on their own. Uh, in the frequently cited text, uh, miscellaneous records of the Western capital, Xijing Zaqi, attributed to someone in the Han Dynasty, but probably written in the sixth century, um, silk twill appeared uh, as, uh, for example, san hua ling, silk twill with scattered pattern. Um, but it's hard to say without um, text and find side by side. Um, we do have a um, inscribed piece dis uh, detailing this twill weave as ling. Um, the text here says, in the first year of Jingyuan, the equivalent tax payment of one bolt of silk, Shuangliu County, eight months, chief accountant. This is pretty phenomenal. Um, the, this kind of structure, the twill, had been previously found in earlier Han textiles, but woven and picked through the, uh, through the uh, warp. Now, among many silks unearthed from the Astana graves in Turfan, dated to the mid-6th century, this is where, when I began to do the uh, silk code research, um, here is the Astana graves, and here's a Gaochang, which I'll be talking about later, Here's Turfan, the oasis below sea level. Um, I found very strange a simple pattern, the tree leaf, that was woven in the very complex weave structure of the warp-faced Kampong Tabi that the Chinese had specialized since um, Han Dynasty uh, from the Ma Wangdui, Jiang Shan, uh, Ma Ling, uh, sorry, Ma Shan, Jiang Ling, and so forth. On the one hand, the tree leaf was not part of the decorative vocabulary for embellishing early Chinese textiles. Uh, indeed, even though the mulberry sustained silkworms in sericulture because its pronunciation sounds the same as the word sang for funeral, the tree, if were to be shown at all, will have to be shown with figures showing that it was the mulberry. But we don't have that um, shown in textiles. On the other hand, the tree leaf was important to the Sogdians who treasured the tree of life. The Sogdians were the people who lived in Sogdiana to the um, west of the Taklamakan Desert in modern day Uzbekistan area. And so to the, for the, um, in the ancient Persia is on their northeast border. Um, and the tree leaf could also be referencing the Bodhi tree leaf uh, connecting with South Asian influence. Um, the most puzzling was the diamond-shaped pattern in the middle of the tree, perhaps designating fruit. Um, the patterns resembled very much pattern on these in the uh, silk socks of earlier Nia finds. Another silk fragment showing awkward geometric shapes in a chessboard pattern was also now woven in warp-faced compound twill. So the patterning was still in the warp, but the ground, the, the binding structure has now moved from the simple tabby to the twill. 
Now, why would you want to do that? Because he doesn't add anything to the pattern or the structure. And also, the pattern is very awkward. Um, these shapes are ill-defined. They are sparsely placed. Uh, we can see the repetition if it's mirror image horizontally or vertically. Um, this was a weave already perfected in the third century on the eastern coast, uh, uh, Mediterranean eastern coast, and not just in wool. By 256 CE, silk weavers in Dura Europos, a Hellenistic, Parthian, Roman city near the village of Salier in today's Syria. Oh, sorry. Here is uh, Dura Europos. Um, they had already woven the weft-faced compound tabby. So the pattern here is in the weft, and the tabby is two-layered, compound tabby. On the right is uh, the reproduction in uh, the late John Becker's workshop at School for Industrial Arts in Copenhagen. He, we successfully reproduced this and um, not using a draw loom, only using pedal, uh, heddle rods. Um, the find on the left with a short Z-twist fiber and was not Chinese long silk S-twist. Possibly the short silk fiber was unraveled from West, uh, woven silks exported from China. This was commonly done. Um, samples of um, Han Chinese silks exported everywhere has been found. This was uh, an example found in Outer Mongolia and is now kept at the uh, Hermitage. And you can see the words and you can see the curvilinear designs. Um, Somehow, in the 7th century, there emerged a still more complex weave, the weft-faced compound twill. Uh, so now we have four possibilities. For the warp-faced, it could be um, compound tabby or compound twill. And then we have weft-faced, and it could be compound tabby or compound twill. So what was going on? Why would you want to make a simple pattern in using a very complex structure? Um, my earlier work showed that the sericulture was well established by the fifth century in Turfan area. The, um, during the, the Han Dynasty, second century, the uh, various emperors had already sent military uh, to occupy certain outposts. And these military outposts brought um, peasant households who brought agricultural techniques like irrigation. This happened both in northwest of China and northeast toward um, Korea. And uh, we had the certain implications for that as well. The mulberry was extensively grown and the local Gaochang government uh, taxed and commissioned the reeling of raw silk each year in the fifth month. Um, further, an unearthed Turfan document lists fire-damaged property of a Gaochang family. They had woven textiles of all kinds, both cotton and silk, silk wore for weaving, three, 38 meters long, silk and cotton yards, sheets of silk warm eggs, the inventory also included clothing, shoes, bowls, wooden plates, housing supplies, and so on. Um, it has been argued, and I think convincingly, that the inventory belonged to a weaving household who did not own the weaving equipment and supplies, and that's why they had to file a report to the government. The absence of any agricultural tools clearly also pointed to the main occupation of this household as textile work. 
Just as the local elite who fled from northwest China brought their methods of control, demanding a list of damaged uh, property, for example, the artisans who did not own materials brought their technical knowledge. Such households probably concentrated in the artisanal quarter outside the temple. So when I first went in 1996, I really knew nothing. And uh, this is a uh, site of the Gaochang wall, the exterior wall. Uh, everything looked vaguely the same, you know, pounded earth and so forth. Um, but when I went back in 2000, and again in 2002, I was absolutely thrilled that I finally understood um, between uh, streets there were sunken parts that would fit extremely well for something like a pit treadle loom that was still practiced um, in this part of Syria. I don't know about today, but certainly when Eric Brody published this book, actually by Brown University, um, I, I understood that um, probably the sunken uh, areas, half like half basement, uh, house the pit treadle kind of loom. And also at this time, uh, there were laws forbidding uh, selling goods with windows. So uh, no windows were allowed facing the street uh, to sell, but there were sunken um, uh, base, a half basement. Uh, it reflected that the Gaochang local government was following the um, fiscal policies of central Tang Dynasty in Xi'an. So then, due to the exceptional social historical circumstances from the late fourth century onward, some adventurous Sogdians came eastward along the Silk Road and met up with some Tang Chinese who escaped civil war from northwest China. As they lived side by side, weavers among them, they probably exchanged ideas and learned from each other. At least, this is what I argued, that one, uh, that the um, Sogdians who wove the uh, tree leaf were trying a pattern that's important to them using the Han Chinese warp based compound tabby. And then we see the Chinese making something uh, of interest to them using uh, Sogdian web-faced technology. As to the Sogdians, some were wealthy merchants, others were poor. They might have worked as soldiers, translators, some worked as craftsmen. Um, I've argued that the wealthy Sogdians commissioned new textile designs that were woven by the Sogdian weavers who had integrated new techniques from the Chinese. The wet faced compound trail eventually led to even more complex weaves. Um, but let's look at some of the weaves now. So here, the, the, um, all this was very exciting to see. Um, the pearl roundel, which was a Sasanian motif, enclosing uh, either ibex or a deer. Um, and here, that would not have been in a pearl rounder, the rounder of the Persian or Sasanian kind. This would be the added gemstones from South Asian influence here and here. Um, the most telling is this. This is an abbreviation of what is known as the royal farm, royal glory. Uh, first seen on the investiture of uh, the um, ruler, king of kings in Persia. And here it's being abbreviated. Now, uh, we also see curvilinear designs. Uh, the circles are not totally symmetric, so they don't have total control over every single warp and weft at this point. This is a Chinese interpretation of the pearl roundel. And you can clearly see it has much more relationship with the earlier geometric rhomboids or diamonds. But within this here, where it, it's um, a pattern repeat here, 
you see a man leading a camel. And this is termed Huangjing, uh, silk showing a foreigner king. So a motif popular of the Silk Road. In terms of color, in terms of the flora, all reminiscent of earlier Han Dynasty vocabulary. Here we have yet another example of Chinese interpretation of the Sasanian pearl roundel. Here we see a more simplified um, gemstone. Uh, we have Chinese words, and we have distinct, this paired um, peacocks, that's inverted here, the eyes, uh, and the fine lines. They all recall uh, how quadrupeds were outlined earlier time. Now, <clears throat> uh, the, so first of all, we have the Chinese who mastered sericulture for the long silk filament, and which led them perhaps to specialize in designs in the warp, and having uh, several layers of warp, which allowed them to make patterns in different colors. Uh, incidentally, when you have two layers of warp, you can make what is known as double cloth. Uh, this afternoon, I was shown a very interesting piece in the collection of a later time period. Um, and double cloth was woven at this time. I did not include it in my slides. I didn't think this would come up. Um, e uh, so essentially, uh, the um, double layers of the warp uh, allowed different colors to come through the warp for patterning. And double layers of weft allowed the patterns to appear in the weft. So the tabby of the twill, twill um, structure, the twill is stronger. If you look at your genes, they are made twill. And so it gives a little bit. And so you can think for um, woolen saddle blankets that's going to be pulled and stretched a little bit. If it's in the twill, it will have more give. It will be easier to use. If it's uh, plain tabby, there's no give at all. So the most complicated was uh, the weft-faced compound twill, which in um, Latin is called semitum. And for the West, weavers became interested in developing complicated weft-faced uh, varieties. And for the Chinese, they reverted back to uh, more complicated warp phase varieties, but incorporating the twill structure, they moved to produce a satin by the 10th century, at least five centuries ahead in West. Now, um, uh, the primarily due to um, interest in Buddhism, Japanese monks made pilgrimage to China in mid-first millennium. Uh, Prince Shotoku was uh, a proponent of Buddhism. He died in 622. This is the earliest Japanese embroidery that has been assembled together. It's known as Tenju Koku, Heavenly Paradise. Um, Prince Shotoku advocated for Buddhism to overcome Shinto's faction in order for him to import Chinese mandate of heaven as a governing system. What I want to show here is uh, not similar weaves that were uh, woven in Japan and preserved at Shoso Yin in Nara, but the embroidery so that you can see the embroidery at the time absorbed Buddhist influence. Uh, I, I've argued this in a paper that this was originally a um, funerary tent uh, commissioned by one of his consorts to, um, at the moment of the funeral to contest uh, the legacy of power. Um, and so we have, for example, the half-gabled uh, architecture that was prominent in China at this time. 
and we have uh, clothing, costumes that were very close to Korean costumes at the time. And these costumes were in fact woven in the silk weaves uh, that we have mentioned. Um, as for the uh, impact on weaves in the West, uh, with time, with migration of artisans, especially during the Mongol period, we became aware of the velvet weaving and weaving with gold. And finally, um, in the 17th century, we have the lampas, which is compound warp and compound weft. The structural complexity was only justified for its luxury because it added nothing more to uh, its functionality. The interesting part is the motif of uh, the elephant that was so popular in the Mughal Empire. I hope I haven't exhausted your patience. Thank you. Maybe I'll wash over you. It took me a long time to understand the differences. Yes. Mm. Well, um, probably because um, in my work on uh, Southwest minorities costumes, um, I, I've actually traced um, a motif used by the Hmong people uh, to Sogdians, um, especially with the royal farm. And um, uh, the uh, some of the Hmong people, uh, they still use reed pipes, musical instruments that were used uh, or found in Lady Di's tomb, for example. And in that area adjacent to it, uh, the Dong people uh, follow Taoism uh, closely. And uh, the Dong people's uh, iconography of constellations of sun and moon, um, I would think would be very closely related to true culture. And so that's very, that will be where the connection will be. Yeah, you should know this, you worked on true culture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would you like me to explain anything else? <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's great to come by. You have a wonderful museum. Um, you have wonderful textiles. Uh, I was shown also some very interesting uh, Japanese textile merchant sample books with rare exotic specimens. It's a dissertation waiting to be written. <laughs> Um, um, there are also other kinds of, um, another piece that was unusual with printed text, uh, repeating date, ministry of uh, ritual, ministry of examination, Han Academy. I have no idea why it is used. Not, and it's done in the same way with uh, uh, gold powder or gilding as found in uh, Lady Di's uh, tomb. Uh, you have wonderful stuff in the museum in terms of textiles, and I hope all the textile students can really take advantage of that. Thank you very much for having me.